so everything fails. <laughs> I mean, if you if 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 nothing changes um, on the software side, then usually the software is fine. But it's it's software, it's hardware, and it's the environment. And something's always changing. And so the robot has to adapt to all of those. On the on the hardware side, things that fail most often are connectors. Um, and after connectors, I would say um, it's probably you know well we we would you think motors because you always think okay motors or anything that moves, but it turns out there's a third one that um, over time fails, which is um, any kind of of lamps in the motor burn out or in the robot burn out, and you think well what lamps do you have in the robot? Um, and the answer is they're hidden inside your 3D cameras. So if the environment is, you know, sunshine, then you have to worry about what's the impact long term of sunshine on typically the outside of the robot. Well, indoors, if you repaint the wall with certain paints, it will absorb that light, right? And then you suddenly the performance will go away. You didn't touch the robot. The robot's working fine, but somebody painted the wall. And in a such a way that you were depending on seeing that wall, and now you can't see it anymore. In this podcast, I'm sharing my passion and curiosity for soft robotics, where we share inspiring stories about the work we do and how we can push the limit. I am Mara Dweeney, and this is Soft Robotics Podcast. Support for this show comes from Science Robotics Journal. I really find Science Robotics to be a great resource for reliable and tangible research where we can really push the limit of the science we do in robotics. Great way to stay up to date with the published article is checking out the released monthly issue. All the links will be included in each episode description. We will also happen to have a regular conversation on the most published science robotic articles where also you can contribute with your question and thoughts about the research. Thanks Science Robotics for sponsoring Soft Robotics Podcast. So I would like to skew over the journey because you have been in a robotics community since many years ago, over 20 years, I believe. And before going to the journey for starting Soviac and the challenges to have a successful robotics company or in the field. So what kind of maybe challenging parts of robotics over the 20 years? Yeah, so robotics has changed a lot over the last 20 years. Um, I think if you go back um, to, you know, around, uh, well, 20 years ago, it would be 2002. And mm-hmm. at that time, um, I, we had just as a community, um, just started to understand really how to do autonomous navigation um, using uh, LIDAR sensors, LIDAR um, and SLAM algorithms were relatively new then. Um, you were seeing the first uh, robotic products outside of factories. Um, and what's happened, you know, in the intervening years is that, uh, computer vision has gotten much, much better. Computer sensors have gotten much more available, much more capable and much more uh, affordable. Um, the, the speed of computation has gotten so that we can really, um, process all the data that we can capture from, uh, sensors in real time, uh, which was not the case 20 years ago. And, um, and I think the, you know, the overall uses of, of robots around people have come in. A challenge 20 years ago was, was putting robots around people safely. Um, and that's something that I think we've done a good job. You've seen um, mobile robots uh, operating around people safely. And you also see, um, uh, industrial arms uh, that can actually be used outside of safety cages. And all that is is stuff that's happened in the last 20 years, thanks to uh, many different advances in technology. Mm-hmm. Wonderful. So I see that uh, in Soviet recently, the design of the robots is tend to be more, I think, friendly and simpler. And I, when I saw that your 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 journey in the, in, in the robotics field, you have witnessed the manipulators and arm and what do you think about from technology perspective and business also that creating robotics that could be helpful for people? 
what kind of design uh, um, consideration or perspective that leads you to design what you already have in now in Soviet, the design of the robots? If you can tell us more about the process of design, why choose that? Yeah, so design, of course, starts with um, who are we designing for? And, and that gets back to the safety thing, right? If you're designing for uh, factories and the robot is going to be in a cage, then the, the people around it really just need to be able to maintain it. We're not trying to appeal to them. But when you put robots into human environments, when you put them into factories, not, not into factories, but if you put them into schools or hospitals or hotels um, around where people are, suddenly you have to pay much more attention to, uh, to the design of the robot because you're going to be interacting with a wide range of people. Um, and so once the robots, once robots in general are safe enough to be around people, now you have to pay attention to make them uh, designed so that they can be acceptable to people, so that people like them. Um, in the end, if you put robots around people and people don't like them, it's very easy for people to disable them. Um, and so, you know, you have to basically appeal to people so that the um, people don't interfere with the function of the robot. Mm -hmm. That's an interesting perspective. Do you think in that case about functionality and the robot design, for example, I don't know, uh, uh, there's no much mini robotics companies recently, but when you see this kind of the functionality and being accepted by general public, do you think there's a trade-off here? How, how, the way that we approach the design process, for example, uh, some people say that robotics are very expensive and they do really like, um, yeah, for example, there's certain robotic for recently. I don't want to mention names, but I think sometimes it doesn't receive the positive feedback. Do you think there's a trade-off here between the design functionality and being accepted by the general public and the cost as well? This kind of parameters here. Yeah, I think, I mean, cost is always... Um is a complicated one because it's tied to value, right? If a robot is, um, you know, making your life much better, then you're happy to have the robot, maybe in spite of design flaws and in spite of, um, uh, of, of other, of, of cost, let's say. But, um, but the value that it brings has to be perceived by all the people who are around it. So if it's bringing value to one person, but a huge cost to another person, that can cause uh, um, resistance as well. So I, I think, you know, when you say a robot is expensive, uh, the question is relative to what? What's your expectation? If your expectation, if you're buying a Roomba, you're comparing it to a vacuum cleaner. And so there's no way that a Roomba um, is going to command, you know, $5,000 price point because vacuum cleaners are in the hundreds of dollars. Um, on the other hand, if you compare uh, a Roomba, uh, I mean, a true autonomous cleaning system, let's say, to the cost of having a uh, cleaning service come and uh, you know, clean every week, if the robot is capable enough to do um, all the cleaning that the cleaning service does, then it, its value should be on par with with the cleaning service, maybe it's even higher. Maybe it does a better job. Maybe it's um, it doesn't have the same kind of privacy concerns of having somebody, you know, a stranger come in and clean. And so there may be benefits above and beyond what people do. But the the fundamental question is, you know, what value is it? And if a robot, let's say, you know, a vacuum robot, only cleans the floor, and so you still need a person and a robot together. Now you have to say, well, how much value did that robot bring to that cleaning person, right? In the end, the cleaning person is doing a job. They're paid a certain amount for that. If they can do the job better, more efficiently, faster, the difference between uh, the value that the robot brings versus without the robot is really, the, is really a way to estimate you know, the true value. And then the cost is just is you know the question about cost is is it above the value it's bringing or below the value it's bringing? Um, it, it's it's kind of silly to talk about an expensive robot versus a cheap robot. You should talk yeah. about a robot that's cost is greater than or less than its value. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking a question about why is it challenging to start 
uh, a robotics business, for example, um, from your experience, do you think that what really challenging? Because I think when we look to um, the hardware, sometimes it's hard to, yeah, to maintain and very expensive. And also sometimes if you have a good idea, but it's not really successfully in, in the markets, sometimes it's kind of what it's not always necessary that if you have a good idea, it will always work. How, how do you see this in the business plan for robotics, starting a robotics company? especially for you, yeah. Yeah, so well, well, robots as a business is challenging um, because first of all, you have to identify um, some need that, uh, that the robot can serve and you have to then um, build a product that can address that need effectively. And so if you look at, you know, um, uh, I don't know, just a typical, uh, a typical example, you know, you start with, um, you know, in our case, a delivery robot. The question is, you know, what needs to be delivered and how often and, and what are the barriers to, to the robot to being able to achieve that? How does the robot, um, you know, ride elevators? How does it get through doors that are locked? Um, mm -hmm. and, and those are the robotics problems. The business problem is, um, what can I deliver that provides uh, sufficient value? If you look in the logistics space, right, the robots are um, are used in lots of different ways. A very clever way is what uh, Kiva does for Amazon, where they bring the the shelves to the to people, and so they let the people do manipulation um, and let the robots do the the moving in. You know, of course, the Holy Grail is a robot that can, you know, move through a space and, you know, in a warehouse and pick things off the shelves, pack them up and, and send them off if you wanted to do a completely automated warehouse. But the reality is, and, and the trick in finding a, a proper business is to figure out what things can you do effectively with robots, what things can people do well, and how can you put people and robots together in a way that produces a much more powerful team than either people by themselves or robots by themselves. What are the strengths of weakness, strengths and weaknesses of robots? What are the strengths and weaknesses of people? And how can we set up the, the business to design the system to take advantage of the best of, of each worker, right? Each type of worker, how do we provide the, the best overall solution? And when you can do that well, you have a you know a winning a winning solution, but the, and the challenge to start a business is to say, you know, what process is out there that robots can help with? Who's doing it now? Which parts do robots take on? Which parts do people continue to do? How do I let the people um, that will you know continue to do this job work at the top of their license, bring the most value? And how do I let the robots help those people um, to either increase the quality of the work or uh, reduce the cost of the work? Um, in, and so there's, you know, the, it's a very complex problem. And, and to solve it, you have to first, you know, understand the business needs and the use case. And then you have to solve the robotics problem, which starts with, you know, a robot hardware. And then there's robot software. And there's, as you mentioned earlier, design and put all those things together. And what you have is a very interesting challenge, um, but it, you know, th and that's why I like robotics. I like robotics because there are so many interesting problems to work on at so many levels. Um, and then that's the same reason why it's, the same reason that it's interesting, which is that it's challenging, also makes it challenging because it's mm -hmm. challenging. Interesting. So based on that, what are the interesting, do you think it's challenging for robotics? If you speak about from Soviet, for example, or robotics in general for real world application, what's still maybe challenging? And I think this is very limiting to that maybe in engineering, technology, understanding based on what you already did. What do you think is still maybe very challenging or limiting? Well, so if you're talking about the technical side, you know, as I said, the, the most challenging thing in robotics, I think, is getting the business case and the use case right. But on the technical side, um, you know, things that we do well are, um, let's see, things that we do well are, are moving 
um, systems, you know, precisely. So we've for 60, 70 years, we've had robots that can move quickly and precisely to a location. When you combine safety with that, um, you necessarily give up some of the speed and um, and power um, unless unless you can add a, um, I mean, a challenge is to, is to sort of maintain speed, precision, power, and add safety to that mix. That's a, that's a challenge. Um, another huge class of challenge is perceiving. So if you want to move through the world, you know, if you're, if you're in a cage, then the cage, the inside of the cage probably isn't changing very much. And, and there's not a lot of unexpected um, obstacles in that space. But when you move through the world, there's all kinds of interesting things that happen. Um, you know, we see robots deployed in public buildings and they, they navigate fine, they avoid obstacles, they are used to um, people moving at certain speeds. Um, and then all of a sudden you'll see a, you know, a big heavy cart coming down the hall at um, what I would consider a dangerous speed pushed by a person um, who yeah. maybe can't even see where the cart's going. And suddenly the robot gets, you know, crushed literally by a cart. Well, you know, that's something that we didn't plan for, we didn't design for um, up front. And when you actually encounter that a couple of times, you say, okay, now how are we going to deal with that challenge? Um, you know, do we move quickly to get out of the way or do we just, um, you know, make the hardware stronger so that it bounces off or, you know, or what's the response? Um, and so, Going back to the design consideration, and why didn't you think about locomotion for Soviet, for example, being in, I see the example already in hospitality or in hospital. Why didn't you think about the locomotion? Is it the easiest way to do it um, for solutions? I don't know what you thought about the design simplicity and don't go for layered locomotion or having arm. Why didn't you do that? Well, yeah, I think, um, you know, again, you, you want to be safe around people and, yeah. and you want to be, um, you do have to pay attention to cost um, as a business. And so um, the choice between wheels and legs, um, you know, legs are hard, right? And uh, it's not that we can't do it. There's plenty of robots that can demonstrate walking around, but um, with, two legs, you don't see um, commercially any robots doing that. And why not, right? It's because uh, if you're dynamically stable, that, you know, if you're walking, you're on two legs, you're necessarily dynamically stable. And if you're dynamically stable, uh, if something goes wrong, you fall. And if there's people around, you fall on people, right? So that's not okay. So, you know, your choice is to, is to implement more legs so that you can be statically stable if the system fails, um, but that's more expensive. Um, it, I'm not sure that it's the wrong thing. I think um, you know Boston Dynamics has a product called Spot that is uh, interesting and can go lots of places, can go up and down stairs, um, and is I, I think can be relatively safe. But there's a lot more motors there, which means there's a lot more things to more cost, more things that can fail. Um, and so if you look at you know, a, a simple robot that's um, differential drive for locomotion versus a walking robot, you know, you have many fewer motors and that means many fewer uh, failure points. Uh, and so I think that's, you know, in the end, that's the reason is you keep it simple unless you need to make it more complicated. Um, you know, if you have to go up and down stairs, then you can't use a, a simple differential drive robot. But if you can avoid going up and down stairs and instead ride the elevator, then you're leveraging um, what the environment provides in order to make a simpler system. Mm -hmm. That's a good point. And of course, what did you learn so over the eight years and so like, what, what kind of maybe thing that you didn't really consider or maybe it was surprising for you that, oh, that's really something we have to consider in the design or... I don't know what other things that you think was really critical, and there was a like a learning lesson, for example, based on the interaction you or feedback from uh, the deploying thing. 
it's an interesting question. Over the eight years of Savio so far, um, we started with let's build a simple robot um, and worry about how to make it actually useful and valuable. Um, and even a simple robot has a lot of complications. You still have to make it. You still have to make it work, the hardware and you know the firmware and the software. Um, you still have to make it work around people. Um, and you know the first big thing that we knew was coming, but we didn't really understand whether how hard it would be to solve is you know riding elevators because we said we'll do indoors. Um, and indoors, mostly you have you know you have to deal with elevators. Um, there are flat buildings or buildings single story, um, and you know you see simple robots today um, serving you know say picking up dishes in restaurants. They can be very simple because they're just um, going on one floor. So that was the first thing that we discovered. I think on the that's on the on the um, on the technical side, on the business side, you know, there's a there's a lot to learn as you get into this about you know who your customer is and how they make buying decisions, and so you know the business side is a whole talk in itself. But if we just focus on the technical side, you know, the first thing is we we understand what robots are, and we came in with a we can build mobile robots that you know are safe around people. But to actually put them in the world and monitor them, you need uh, to think about how they're going to stay connected to the network all the time, how you're going to deal with failures that happen because the network drops out or because some component of the hardware goes out. How do you provide a service, a reliable service for your customers uh, over a long period of time? And how do you think about um, what happens when something breaks? Who's going to fix it? How quickly are they going to fix it? Um, and how easy is it going to be to fix it? All those things are the considerations that you don't think about in, you know, in in robotics class, but you do have to think about when you're actually going to put robots in the world. So I would like to ask about the failure. Uh, from your experience, which part is more prone to failure? Is it the hardware side or software side? And how make sure this kind of resilience or redundancy and the robots operate even if there's failure happening. What does the likelihood for a scenario like that? Yeah, so um, uh, so everything fails. <laughs> I mean, if you if 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 nothing changes um, on the software side, then usually the software is fine. But it's it's software, it's hardware, and it's the environment, and something's always changing. And so the robot has to adapt to all of those. On the, on the hardware side, things that fail most often are connectors. Um, and after connectors, I would say um, it's probably, you know, well, we, we would, you think motors, because you always think, okay, motors or anything that moves. But it turns out there's a third one that um, over time fails, which is um, any kind of, of lamps in the motor burn out or in the robot burn out. And you think, well, what lamps do you have in the robot? Um, and the answer is they're hidden inside your 3D cameras. So inside your 3D cameras, you're projecting something. And if you um, aren't careful to you know, turn those off from time to time and you just let them run for years on end, at some point, those lamps burn out. And so, you know, and I say lamp, I mean, uh, you know, an LED uh, projecting a pattern that the camera is reading back in order to see in 3D. But you know, those things fail. And I think one of the things that we've learned over eight years is um, we can probably now produce a list for ourselves of what are all the things that will break in a robot after it's been in the field for three years or five years? And what do we look for? Um, you know, another unexpected component um, is whatever drives you're using in your computer wear out, right? Even SSDs, you think SSDs don't have moving parts, but they have a limited number of writes. And so you have to think about how many times am I writing, you know, those log files because you only get so many writes. It's a lot, it's, you know, it's billions or trillions, but if you're writing all the time, eventually it runs out. And, and so you can predict, you know, what that failure will be. And so 
it's almost like every component of the robot, if you're gonna keep robots in service for a long time, every component, you have to think what would cause this to fail? Um, you know, plastic, if you, plastic is probably not gonna fail in most robots lifetime. But if you look at cars, you know, a 20 year old car may run fine, but the plastic around the windows and, you know, in the dashboard is cracking if it's been in the sun. So, you know, where the robot is operating um, is going to affect what fails. And there's just a lot of things that you have to, you know, be flexible and learn and adapt. Mm -hmm. That's a good point. Do you think this is related to the indoor and outdoor application? Since we speak mostly, most of robots are designed for indoor application. And do you think if we design autonomous robots to go for uncertain location or new structure, structures, do you think the design here will be different completely? Or how do you approach this kind of, of course, where I, I go to the robot indoor, outdoor, level of autonomy in the robot, how this affect and design, how do you see all these factors here? Later? Yeah, I mean, if you, if you think of a robot outdoors, right, versus a robot indoors, the, the, you know, that's the third factor, right? You have software, hardware, and the third one is environment. So if the environment is, you know, sunshine, then you have to worry about what's the impact long-term of sunshine on typically the outside of the robot. Um, if you think about indoors, um, what systems and um, properties of the environment do you depend on? Um, if you're, let's just a, a simple thing, right? Everybody uses either lasers or 3D cameras where we're projecting an infrared pattern and reading back something from that. Um, well, indoors, if you repaint the wall with certain paints, it will absorb that light. Right, and then you suddenly the performance will go away. You didn't touch the robot, the robot's working fine, but somebody painted the wall and in a such a way that you were depending on seeing that wall and now you can't see it anymore. Right, mm -hmm. um, somebody mounts a mirror on the wall. Right, suddenly the environment is radically different from where it was. Somebody changes the window treatments in an indoor robot such that the sun now shines brightly on the floor or they change the floor and make it shiny where it used to be carpet. Or they change the floor and make the carpet thicker because it's new, nice, soft, plush carpet. And the robot's now having to struggle to get through that, right? Every, um, you know, there's so many things that change in an environment. And if you look over a period of years, um, you know, the first year that we were in business, we noticed small changes. Like um, at the holidays, they redecorate the lobby in a hotel. That redecoration means they moved the furniture around and they added a you know, Christmas tree or some other things. And suddenly everything's different. And, and if you need to go near that section of the lobby, suddenly you have to retrain the robot. Okay, that's a simple case. But um, you know, there's lots of examples of things that change in the world. Um, usually um, in commercial spaces and over the last 20 years, we update the Wi-Fi regularly. If you update the Wi-Fi, you have to remember to tell the robot that you updated the Wi-Fi or it's off the Wi-Fi, right? And so that's a failure, but it's not the robot failure. It's just the environment changed and you have to deal with it. So the, you know, part of the design challenge and the ongoing design challenge is designed for failures in, or, you know, failures in hardware because things wear out, failures in software because things change and they change out from under you, right? You're, you're using operating system, you get a new patch. The new patch um, causes, uh, you know, requires you to upgrade to some new software package and suddenly that breaks things, right? Um, and the environments change all the time. So one of the challenges of, of putting robots in the world for a long period of time is the world changes, right? The world changes, the software changes, the hardware wears out. And, and you have to think about as a business, how do I update the robots in a way that deals with all these changes regularly? Mm -hmm. That's a very good point. Yeah. And maybe I'm curious to ask you what would be exciting parts so far and maybe frustrating besides what you mentioned, maybe ongoing, maybe. Yeah, something was very exciting, highlighted through this eight years, very exciting moments and maybe frustration as well. Um, 
Well, the most exciting, the most exciting moments are when we see people interact with the robots and get really delighted by them. So, you know, the first time, uh, you know, somebody opened a door to a, to a robot that they weren't expecting and they're like, wow, this is great. You know, and, and they're not, they don't know you're listening because, but they, you know, if you're, if you're standing back, just making sure the robot works, you know, this happened to us and it, it's really exciting to see people get really excited about it. Um, I think frustrations are, you know, the normal engineering frustrations you find. There's a problem, you can't reproduce it. Um, you need, you know, it's stopping the robot from working reliably. You think you fixed it, you go home and you find out that it failed and you have to go back again. That, um, you know, those kind of challenges where, you know, you, you try to get to the root cause of something, um, or things, you know, break when you don't expect them to break. That's always frustrating. Um, mm -hmm. And so, you know, it's sort of an ongoing balance between, you know, new things that um, uh, make you happy about how the robots are working in the world. And, and often that's seeing other people delighted by it, or happy with it. And, and those are the great things. Um, and that's balanced with you know, things are always changing and, and change means often breaking and then you have to fix them. And, and, you know, getting that model of the world right is so that you can make people happy is I think both the excitement and the challenge. That's so good. And I'm curious about the human computer interaction or maybe robot interaction in that case. There's kind of psychology in the design that, um, that for example, human can connect with a robot. And I think that you, the design consideration this kind of connection. Can you tell us more about how we make sure also that robot has this kind of connection or psychology to connect with the person they are dealing with? Yeah, I think it's it comes from a place of understanding um, what the person is expecting of this robot, right? What's the user's conceptual model of the robot and the task and the world and how the robot fits in? And when you understand what's expected and you can achieve that, then you can have a, a good success in terms of human computer interaction. Um, and when you don't understand the user's conceptual model, um, it may be more sophisticated than you think it is. Um, but when you don't understand it, that's when you get breakdowns. And so part of you know the, the, the key, I think, to design starts with number one, really good listening, but it's listening not just for what people say they want, but for what they're trying to do and how they see the world. And then there's a creative step, which is how can I um, interpret that and come up with a solution that will delight them in the end, right? And, and that's, the, that's the fun and creative part. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. So I'm curious, what could be other maybe version or upgrades do you think about for Soviet, the, the robots here? What do you think the feature do you think you wish that be, could be incorporated in future versions? Maybe still, yeah. The thing that we really wanted um, for a long time was for the robot to be able to be installed easily at a new site, right? You you. Talk about you know the robot, the hardware. You're going to send the hardware somewhere. You've got software, um, of course, and then you want to adapt it to an environment quickly. And um, so the thing we've done recently is added a little bit of manipulation that's still safe, I think, and elegant, but um, but not um, but but that allows us to interact with the world more than we could with just a simple differential drive robot. So we added not a full seven degree of freedom arm, um, but just a simple you know, two degree of freedom pusher that we can use to push buttons. Um, and pushing buttons turns out to be how um, the world is designed for people. And so we've used the Americans with Disabilities Act as a guide to you know, where buttons might be and what you might need to push. Um, and that's allowed us to go from you know, putting a robot in taking, you know, months of time and effort to literally days. Um, and in a few days, we can have a robot uh, working on a site. We think we may be able to get that down to hours, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, it, the dream, of course, is you ship a robot, it, it, you know, you open the box, you plug it in, 
and then it learns its environment. And for some consumer products, um, I think we're getting pretty good at that, electronic products. Um, you know, I mean, obviously, if you don't need much interaction with the world, you know, you put a microwave oven, you put it on the counter, you plug it in, it works, right? Mm -hmm. That's simple. Um, but if you, you know, if you want to talk about a, um, you know, a robot that is going to move through an entire space, then it has to be able to comprehend that space. You have to have a model of that space. Um, and so I think, you know, for me, the, the dream is making the robots um, easier and easier to adapt to their environment so that they can be effective sooner um, so that you can, you know, get down to business, which is doing whatever the robot's supposed to be doing. Mm -hmm. Great. So, Sam Circles, and I have a big question for you. Maybe the first one about making sure that what you design is really useful. And I, I'm, I'm curious about your view since you have been in robotics for many years. For example, there is design for robots like humanoid robots or this kind of robot that you sometimes question what could be application or why we design what we design. Yes, it's impressive, but it doesn't give me be value. So, how do you see the approaches in other yeah, like a robotic solution, designing humanoid robots or impressive facial expression. Do you think that's uh, the right way to go? Or do you think from your perspective that we should really give more attention to this problem and the challenges that help people really? Well, I mean, for me, robots are all about helping people, right? That's the first thing. You, you, you design a robot um, because you want to make some person's life better. Um, and whether that's a, a vacuuming robot or whether it's a delivery robot or whether it's a robot that's, um, you know, helping to make cars better or, or cheaper, um, the, the point of the robot is to take on the, you know, we always say dirty, dull and dangerous tasks um, and, and let people, you know, ideally live a better life. That's the case of not just robots, but any automation is something that we're doing because you know we want things to be a certain way we're trying to control the chaos that we find in the world right and and ideally the robot is not adding to the chaos it's uh it's on your side and it's helping you um you know uh, uh order your world better right that's yeah. that's what robots should be able to do so you know when you sit out to to design a robot you're asking um you know what do am I or the people that the robot is going to interact with? What what are they doing, and what should they be doing? Right? What's the what's the good use of a nurse's time in a hospital? The good use of a nurse's time is spending time with the patients, right? So I'm not interested in designing robots that are going to try to take um, take over the job of you know interacting with patients because there's a there's is a true value of that nurse you know, the human touch of that nurse being with a patient. Um, on the other hand, the nurse didn't learn in nursing school how to carry, you know, uh, medicine down the hallway or, you know, basically walking down the hallway is not something that is, you know, there's no class for that in nursing school for a reason, right? It's, it's such a low level task that it's taken for granted, but it takes time. And so if we can have a robot doing the delivery and a, and a nurse spending the time with the patients, that's a win that improves the patient's outcomes and the patient's lives. It improves the nurse's um, happiness and quality of, of work life. Um, and it, um, you know, allows the robot to do what it's good at, right? And so I think, you know, that general approach of letting people work at the top of their license, whatever that license is, right, whatever it is, their skill set, let me use the skills that are unique to me as a human being and let robots take the, the boring tasks or the dull tasks or the time consuming tasks off of my plate. Um, and let me, you know, it, it might even be, you know, in a case of, of, uh, of home, right? If you enjoy um, cleaning your home, then you should do that, right? If you enjoy living in a clean home, but you don't like cleaning, then you should get, you know, so you should get the home cleaned in some other way than you do it, right? If it, like it, it doesn't bring me joy personally to, to clean. Um, I would just, I like to be around in a clean environment. So if a robot can keep it clean, great. Um, 
and you know, there's a, um, I, I think that's the way, that's the way I think about it is, is how do I understand what people want to do, what, what brings people fulfillment and enrichment and let robots fill in the gap so that people can do what they should or, or want to do. Excellent answer. Excellent. So I think two questions, three questions left. I think the first one about the venture capitalist, uh, how make sure you find the right people that can invest in the idea? Because I think, yeah, sometimes it's challenging to find the right people that can invest and believe in what you really, if you have a demo prototype, but for my experience, the venture capitalist and the money to support the first initial step of the idea, is it challenging or how do you see the advice maybe here if you can give it? Yeah, I think that I think the thing to that needs that you need to understand is, you know, it, like like with anything and, and any person that you're dealing with, what what is their goal, right? And you have to start with that. And I think a lot of times, um, you know, people don't understand um, how venture capital works or what the venture capitalist goal really is. Um, I mean, everybody says, okay, 10x return on the money. Sure. But um, but why is that, right? And what are they actually looking for? And I think the, you know, the, the thing that's hard as a new entrepreneur is to understand what's going to happen three funding rounds in the future. Not what, you know, the first funding round, you can ask people and understand it, but it's hard to understand what's going to happen over the next 10 years um, in terms of funding your company and why. Um, and, and, and so getting your head around that and, and then understanding that, um, you know, raising money, one of my advisors once said, raising money is like, um, is like getting married, right? It, it actually, once you've taken money from somebody, you're gonna be with them for a long time. Um, mm. and, and so you better make sure at the beginning that you have an alignment of values that you know that you understand why they're investing and it's reasons that are compatible with what you're trying to do that your beliefs are aligned and and that's hard to do when you're starting to raise money because you're thinking i need to raise money i need you know i don't i don't, you have you haven't met that many it's like it's like trying to get married when you haven't ever dated right it's like you either either somebody has to you know, arrange this marriage, right? And tell you, this is who you should raise money from, or you need to talk to a lot of people beforehand. And usually there's not time. You're busy building the product, understanding the market, doing all the other things. That, that I think is the hardest thing about, um, about venture capital is just understanding, you know, expectations and, and how the world will evolve over time in a company. I like the metaphor. I think it's very, very excellent also to bring this perspective. I think two question maybe for soft robotics. Do you think there's a value because we have now soft robotics Inc. For soft robotics, do you think how do you see from the market perspective? Do you think there's a lot of potential or still not really clear? How do you think about soft robotics? I, I mean, soft robotics is is essentially um, it it's a capability. Right. It's a um, usually when we think about soft robotics, we're maybe thinking, OK, it's not as precise. It's going to, um, you know, conform to the environment in different ways. Um, and there's a lot of technical challenges in, you know, because, you know, we have CAD systems that can model rigid robotics quite well. Modeling um, soft things generally is challenging. And so um, I think part of it is you know, maybe I haven't worked in soft robotics too much myself, but um, but having the right model uh, and understanding what the um, uh, the mathematics of it, you know, I think it doesn't meet, doesn't match, you know, what's taught in the early robotics classes, let's say, right? It's always a graduate class. And so if you, um, that, you know, that makes it hard, right? But but it's hard because it doesn't match the models that we we have. In some ways, it may be easier, and it may be better for the world. But um, I think the reason it's challenging is just, um, you know, we have we have to be able to model what this robot's going to do well um, before we can do more. I think it's uh, you know it's it's something that that we're going to need over time to do more and more tasks. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. Great. So lastly, I'm curious in this journey, uh, what makes you fulfilled in what you do? Sometimes you have ups and downs. Um, what makes you fulfilled? Well, you know, I, I like to, um, I like to set a goal and, and achieve it. Right. So, yeah. you know, for me, um, you know, seeing people, uh, use robots that we build, um, successfully and, and, and be happy with the experience is, is fantastic. Right. I like to see the, um, the people on my team succeed. Right. For me, this is, you know, how do we get to, um, a place where the, you know, we all feel like, hey, we've done a good job for the world. We've done a good thing. Um, you know, in the end, uh, um, putting robots out and having them actually help people and having people, you know, recognize that they've been helped is is fantastic. Mm-hmm. Wonderful. I don't know if you have any final words like say for the people listening or robotics community. Any final words like say? Well, I just think you know, robotics is such an interesting area because it's so broad and deep at the same time uh, technically that it's a very uh, you know i I, i'm happy to to have people working on robotics i i think about um about when i've worked with with robotics people and looking at problems uh the way robotics people look at problems is just interesting it's just uh, you know, you frame the problem, you you uh, model it mathematically, and then you see results come out. And it's uh, it's just an exciting area to be in. And so I'm I'm happy. Anybody who's listening to this pod podcast is uh, you know is probably doing so because they they love robots and they love solving these problems. And it's a it's a great career. Mm-hmm.